8.55 Eastern Daylight Time. And Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. An armistice between France and Germany was signed at Compiègne this afternoon. But it will not take effect until six hours after formal notice has been exchanged of a similar arrangement between France and Italy. And there is evidence that some French leaders find the terms so harsh that they doubt if it is worthwhile accepting them. An official announcement from Bordeaux tonight says that the armistice negotiations are virtually completed. A little earlier, heavily censored dispatches from the French capital quoted Minister of the Interior Pomeray as saying that the final French decision would be made after study of both the German and Italian demands, which means not before tomorrow and perhaps later. Tonight, a broadcast in London by General de Gaulle, former Assistant Defense Minister in the Reno Cabinet, who, due to faulty transmission, was at first confused with the present Minister of Defense, said that the armistice would mean surrender of all France's arms and occupation of the entire country. And he called for the assembling of the largest possible French forces to continue the war elsewhere, either in England or the colonies. Such an armistice, he said, would be not capitulation but slavery. We have had no trustworthy news of the French fleet today, except that some of its units were with British warships at Alexandria when the Italians made an unsuccessful air attack this morning. None of the many rumors about the French Navy are yet confirmed, but the flight of great numbers of French planes to Algeria, from which colony they can go on fighting, suggests that possibly some of the fleet may make a similar decision. Nor have we yet any details as to the terms of the armistice, news of which was first brought by our correspondent William L. Shirer in a joint broadcast with William C. Kirker of the National Broadcasting Company from Compiègne this afternoon. However, General Hunsinger, head of the French armistice delegation, said that the terms were very hard, and he consulted with the Bordeaux government last night and again this morning before he signed them. The French delegates then left by plane for Italy, and a remark of Mr. Kirker's that the terms would not be made known till after the armistice with Italy had been arranged and might never be made known at all suggests that the Germans may have had their doubts about acceptance. Also, this broadcast to the United States, which of course had to be passed by the German censorship, was released more than two hours before the German government decided to inform its own people and the rest of Europe that the armistice had been signed. Whatever objections many Frenchmen may have to the terms, however, it does not appear that much effective resistance is any longer possible except on the sea and in the colonies. The Germans claim today that the remains of three French armies in Alsace and Lorraine had surrendered, a total of about half a million men, though it was admitted in Berlin that the garrisons of some isolated parts of the Maginot Line were still holding out. The Germans also occupied the Atlantic port of Lorient and the channel port of Saint-Malo, and the French reported that as German troops continued to advance down the Rhone Valley, the Italians for the first time attacked at several points and were repulsed. German informants at Compiègne told a correspondent of the International News Service that a conference for a permanent peace not only with France but with Belgium and the Netherlands might be held next week, perhaps at Münster in Westphalia, where the Peace of Westphalia was concluded in 1648. An omen of the results of this treaty, as well as of the Treaty of Versailles, has recently been announced as one of the German war aims, and it was that treaty which, among other things, gave formal international recognition to the independence of the Netherlands. Speculations built on Russian troop movements into the Baltic states were ridiculed tonight by the Russian official news agency TASS, which said that the Russian troops on the Baltic were not 100 or 150 divisions, as some reports had it, but only 18 or 20, and that they were not concentrated on the German frontier or intended for pressure on Germany. Good relations have been established between the Soviet Union and Germany, said the Russian agency, and these are based not on a passing motive of temporary character, but on the fundamental interests of the two states. European affairs are having their echoes in Philadelphia, where the Republicans are gathering for the national convention, which begins next Monday. After the first flurry of protest against the appointment of Colonels Knox and Stimson to the Roosevelt cabinet, it was said today that Governor Stassen of Minnesota, the keynote speaker, will praise the appointments as a needed strengthening of the administration. And Governor Landon, chairman of the subcommittee writing the foreign policy plank of the platform, said that it would probably not be written until Germany's peace terms to France were known. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.